Hello and welcome to our conversation as part of the Bloomington Early Music Festival. I'm Sarah Ift Decker. I'm Assistant Professor of History at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. Although I do have a Bloomington connection, I was a postdoc at Indiana University in the Bourne's Jewish Studies program for three years. And I'm a historian of the intersections between gender and religious difference in the medieval Mediterranean with a particular focus on the Iberian Peninsula. And uh, today I'll be speaking with Claire Norburn. So Claire, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'm Claire Norburn. I'm a, a soprano and playwright, and I'm the artistic director of the ensemble The Telling, uh, based here in London. Um, and we are thrilled to be um, our, our, to have our film screened for a second time. Um, uh, last year, um, Bloomington um, Early Music Festival screened Unsung Heron about uh, the woman troubadour Beatrice Adia. Uh, this year, uh, we're talking about Into the Melting Pot, which is a concert play uh, of both music, medieval music and drama that I've written about the expulsion of the Jews in 1492. Yes, which is, uh, of course, uh, something that then connects a lot with my research. So I'm very excited to have a chance to chat with you about this today. Uh, so I wanted to start by asking you about uh, about your choice for the title Into the Melting Pot. So uh, what were the kind of resonances of the term melting pot for you? What were you hoping to kind of imply and think about with this terminology? Um, and then maybe we can talk a little bit about, about medieval Iberia as, as a melting pot. Great. Uh, yes, well, it was the, the, the title um, seemed kind of an obvious one to me because um, I was comparing and contrasting two kind of related um, musical um, repertoires. Uh, one, the Sephardic uh, tradition, uh, which comes out of 1492, the expulsion of the Jews, and a kind of longing uh, for their homeland written in Ladino, the Spanish dialect um, associated with the, the Sephardic Jews and the, the, the um, diaspora um, from Spain in 1492. Uh, but also the earlier traditions, uh, medieval traditions, from the court of Alfonso the Wise, particularly the the, the Cantigas de Santa Maria, which kind of musically reflect uh, a, a really interesting melting pot, uh, that's what I would say, um, where we know that um, Jewish, Christian and Muslim musicians all worked on that collection and worked and were engaged by um, Alfonso the Wise um, in the second half of the 13th century. So, um, it was kind of like, how did you get from that journey mm -hmm. to 1992? And those, those, um, and and what the earlier um, repertoire reflects is this extraordinary place. When you look at Europe as a whole, um, how um, Spain, just for modern parlance, of course, it wasn't really Spain in in the Middle Ages, and um, that period, the Iberian Pen Peninsula, is perhaps the more correct way of looking at it and terminology that we we would probably use. Um, how that was so different from other parts of Europe where the Jews were really not to tolerated and certainly not the Muslims either. Um, and how, um, and yet, and here we were with um, a number of different um, areas across Europe going off on crusades. So to think of a place where relatively, not when we can't look at it through the eyes of modern liberalism, but relatively to the rest of Europe, Spain was kind of an interesting place. Yeah, and one of the one of the ways historians have often talked about that is uh, with the with the term convivencia, which uh, has often been used to evoke this kind of interfaith utopia, uh, which, uh, you know, as as we as I think the film uh, very much kind of gets at right, the reality is certainly more complicated. Than yes, that. Definitely, definitely. Uh, better than anywhere else, but not ideal. And I, I think what I was trying to bring out in, in, in writing the play, which really struck me when I started to research uh, the period, is that the, the kind of, as I put it, the firewood for 1492 has been there for a very long time. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, and then and when we'll get to more of that in the moment, but I was just going to say on the, the kind of slightly positive end of things, right? Yeah. Um, the thing that I do think is interesting about this term convivencia is that it literally translates to living together. And that is one of the things that I find so striking is that while it is not, in fact, always harmonious, there is so much interconnection and communication 
between Jews, Christians, and Muslims in the Iberian Peninsula during this period. Uh, and I think that's something that's been really, fa that was really fascinating in terms of how you, uh, you brought that out within the film. Thank you. I mean, that was what was fascinating to me too. And I wish I'd had a chance. I wrote this in 2017. I wish I had a chance to read your your books. I've got one on order now. So, um, but what I did read, you know, fascinating stories, snippets of stories and snapshots of women who did marry, intermarry, or did kind of break the rules, but the violence that often went with that. Um, yes tells a, yeah. a very interesting story of it, things are not entirely as ideal as perhaps we might mm -hmm. like the idea. Yes, yes. And it's all very complicated and messy. Uh, so I wanted to, of course, make sure to spend some time talking about the music aspect of this film, uh, including some ways in which I think that really highlights some of that complexity. Uh, so you've touched on this a little bit, but could you say a bit more about how you selected the songs that were used in the film and uh, what kind of points did you hope to make using this particular kind of blend of musical material? Yeah, and I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question because actually the music was the starting point in putting together the show, um, not the historical point. And that is kind of why it's kind of backward looking. Um, as I mentioned, I was really, um, I've done a lot of uh, the Cantigas of Santa Maria and also other Spanish medieval repertoire of the same period. So there's a wonderful collection, um, the Libra Vermel, which is um, a collection of 11 pilgrim songs that uh, were kind of um, you know, encouraged to be sung for pilgrims on the way to Montserrat, which is also a similar kind of period to the Cantigas. Um, and also we include um, what is arguably one of the earliest um, song cycles by Martin Kodash, the a, a Galician um, compo well, composer, I think quite the right word, but uh, poet and, and uh, creator. Um, music creator is the modern term, and actually I think that's quite a good term for, for um, yeah. musicians, composers in the, in the Middle Ages. Um, so it was kind of how I would combine that repertoire, which I know really, really well, with the Sephardic repertoire, which I also love. Um, and what is great about this this particular uh, film, as you will see, so the other singer who joins me is Maya Levy, who is uh, American. Um, she lives over here now. Um, she um, has studied, um, she studied with Joel Cohen and Anna Zimmer um, and Boston Hamarata. But she also is a, a, an actor and she also sings plasma music. Um, so she's kind of, but, and her grandparents um, speak Ladino. Um, oh. fact, they used to use it as a secret language so the children couldn't understand what they were talking uh -huh. about, apparently, <laughs> uh, which is a wonderful story. So um, it was kind of bringing her in and looking at the the history of the, the the Sephardic songs which are fascinating because they we've lumped them together but actually um some of them go really you know do have roots we believe going back to 1492 some of them are much later what's interesting about them is that they pick up just as the Cantigas pick up the the nuances of the the Christian Jewish and Muslim kind of combination of musicians working together so in, juggling in my excitement, jiggling my camera. Sorry about that. Um, but just as that happens, um, you get other influences. So the Turkish Sephardic repertoire sounds different from yeah. um, perhaps the Bulgarian or, you know, so that it's picking up influences in the same kind of way, which I, th I kind of think is, is interesting and also reflects the kind of the melting pot title, I think. Um, so I really wanted to start with how could I bring those two tr two repertoires together in a, in a in a concert and in a concert play because that's very much what I do, and that left left me with a bit of a problem about how where would I place it, you okay. know? So would I place it in 1492? And in the end, I the, my um, solution about how I could bring that together in one moment of time is to have my character Blanca, who's Jewish, who's about to leave. She, it's, it's time is running out. Um, the Jews have till until the end of July 1492 to leave. That's that's what the edict says, and she's only really she's going the next day. They haven't left my time. They've got to get out, and it's about how she is so integrated into yes. her home, 
entered that melting pot tradition, for want of calling it anything else, um, and how she comes together. And so I, she's kind of connected almost telepathically to the past and to other women. And that is how I, how I have managed to bring the, the drama and the music together. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I find the Contigas de Santa Maria in particular so fascinating there. Um, I teach the uh, the texts and the images associated with them very wow. frequently in my courses. And one of the things that's so fascinating is that on the one hand, there are all these connections that they have to this tradition of interconnection and communication between faiths. Uh, but at the same time, there's some really kind of vitriolic, nasty material in there. I mean, there's some real hostility toward yeah. Jews and Muslims. Uh, so what are I don't know, what are your thoughts about kind of how how we should think about the Cantigas in the, in the context of medieval Iberia's, you know, very, very complicated multi-religious history? Well, I think it is, it is, it is, it does lay the, the, the sort of groundwork for what happens in the pogroms of 1391, uh, which don't happen that much later. And, um, you know, in a sense, but also thinking back to, I, I think there, there is that tension um, between not being able to, perhaps being able to live together, but actually you can't almost say it. And I, and I think, so in, in the, there's one um, Cantiga that we do, and it was a very hard decision for me to say, you know, because they are, they are anti-Semitic, some of the Cantigas, they are um, very um, difficult for us with modern ears. Um, and so I really had to make the decision, should I include this or should I not? But in the end, dramatically, I felt, kind of felt like we had to do it. We had to show what the reality was um yeah. and so we do include a, 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 an anti-semitic cantiga near the end um and it's about blanca my character's reaction to that yeah of seeing and knowing that that tension is there and always has been there mm -hmm. yeah no absolutely and there i mean there, there's such an interesting rich source i think so you use the one uh, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, about the uh, the woman who is being uh, executed, right? The Jewish woman who yeah, is being she's been shoved off a cliff. Um, right. yes. Calls out to the Virgin Mary, and there's also yeah. one with this uh, this Jewish woman who's um, having a very difficult childbirth, uh, who also then you know calls out to the Virgin Mary, which I find so interesting because while on the one hand, you know, I always want to kind of take these you know Christian anti-Jewish accounts with you know very a very very heavy grain of salt but on the other hand you do kind of have to wonder in this atmosphere if you know in that kind of moment right of being about to be executed of being worried you're going to die in childbirth if you know you just call out to anything you can think of right <laughs> yeah and you call out to the persecutors yeah yeah uh, Virgin Mary you know that that yeah. that I think that's it, it is quite an interesting idea mm -hmm. um and obviously that's the context because in all the stories they call out to the Virgin Mary and they're saved and, and, and she intervenes. That's but but it is interesting that there is that darkness mm -hmm. and yet somehow they are saved. So that there is I, I think that's quite an interesting story. Mm -hmm. But somehow that there is that dichotomy between we have to make these people different. Yeah. But we are also prepared to save them, which I think very much goes with our sense of liberalism. We will let these people be here, but we will remind them that they're different, um, which, which is, I think, the message in the Cantigas. Yeah, and I absolutely. think the message that also that, that there's references to the um, by the time you get a um, hundred years on where where there are edicts about what the Jews must wear. Um, and uh, differentiation, which of course you know, makes one think of Nazi Germany. It's very, that's right. very similar, um, mm -hmm. disturbing um, situation. So, um, and I, I, I do think I felt it was very important that we did show that moment of darkness, yeah, um, so that people could see that that there was this real dichotomy. There's a friendship there. And it's it's like when you, when you do and you do hear people who are racist who kind of say, oh, it's not you, it's not you. I don't mean you. And I think there's a lot of that that happens in this in this repertoire. And 
probably in those inter interrelations that 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 Blanca, who's down the street, she's okay. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't want the rest of the Jews here. I, I, I think there's quite a lot of that in the county does. Yeah, and I, I think about that all the time. And so I work a lot with um, contracts. And in particular, I have, uh, it's not the only thing that Jews are doing, but uh, because it's the kind of thing that gets documented, I have a lot of loan contracts. Uh, and I often kind of think about the ways in which I don't think those relationships are always acrimonious. I think there are a lot of moments where we can see, for example, uh, Jews have repeat clients, right? That the same Christians are going back to the same Jewish lenders, which suggests to me, right, that there's some kind of basis of trust, of a connection. And at the same time, I don't think that means that that person wouldn't say nasty things about Jews or participate in anti-Jewish violence if the opportunity potentially arose, right? I don't think, I think those things can kind of exist in tandem. Yes, and I think that that's probably what the day-to-day -day experience was. And that was what, that's kind of what I was interested in because, um, you know, I, do, I don't have the depth of knowledge that you have. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm a magpie really as a writer, you know, I find a project, I learn about it as much as I can. And then I try and imagine what that human experience was in, the, in that historical context. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose that's what I've tried to do is think what Blanca's day-to-day -day life um, would have been like. So there are references very early on to her son David coming home having been beaten up, for example. Yeah. yeah. And a big part of the focus on her day to day life also involves these discussions uh, of her relationships with other women, as well as these kind of telepathic connections that you mentioned, right, that she has with these other women of various different faiths. Uh, and, you know, this, this kind of topic, right, of relationships between women is one that both is extremely important and that we've acknowledged as scholars is so important. It's also in various ways challenging, but really enriching to study. Uh, so I was wondering how you how you came to that as the, the kind of in particular focal point in a lot of ways of the film of the relationships and connections between women specifically of different faiths. Yeah, well, I definitely wanted it to be a woman, um, but for many reasons one of which is completely external to the um to the narrative and to the project which is that i've written two other um projects about extraordinary um medieval women but in both cases real women of course blanca is uh, uh, you know we don't have uh, the same we don't have a hildegard of bingham like who's one of the others or a, a beatrice de dia um we not that we have very much to go on beatrice de dia either but but we don't have a kind of factual person that i could pin it on that, that kind of became clear. So I kind of had to imagine her drawing in what I could and the stories that I could find. Um, but it felt to me that that makes it much, much more interesting. So I want it to be a third woman, so it could be a trilogy. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, yeah. but I also think it's more interesting because then that's where, as a dramatist, you can perhaps go, where as a historian, you, you're more challenged that you can just imagine it. So I yeah. can make up. So yeah. I wanted to choose. I mean, that's one of the things. Her name is Blanca, um, mm -hmm. and that was a very popular name for Jewish women um, in in the, in the area. And um, I think also that's a fascinating point. So they um, often women often took um, local localized names, not um, traditional yeah. um, Jewish yeah. names, yeah. Uh, which shows again how integrated she is. Absolutely. She's got a Spanish name, and I thought that was really really important. Um, and so I, I suppose I just wanted to give the underdog a voice, which uh -huh. is what we can often do in drama. Yeah. Oh, I've heard other dramatists are right, and, 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 and poets write about that's the interesting thing you can do is you can often take the angle of the person who is not so well known yeah. and present it from their point of view as a dramatist. So um, I felt that, that that gave me an opportunity to look at these look at things through her point of view and from her point of view as a woman who is really powerless so she has not made the decision to leave yes. her son yeah. has made the decision to leave he rules the roost he's made the decision she's going whether she likes it or not because she yeah. hasn't had any choice which yeah. i also think dramatically is very interesting mm -hmm. and very reflective of you know the the realities of women's experiences in a lot of ways uh, and you see you see such interesting things and so you know I 
I don't have women's voices in the way that you're able to kind of create through a, a dramatic performance, but I have a lot of accounts of ordinary women, uh, you know, from the perspective of contracts. And so there's, you know, so much that you can see as this is, you know, example that's from uh, not from the Iberian Peninsula proper, but from Palermo, which would have been under the rule of the Kingdom of Aragon, so part of the Iberia, so, you know, kind of part of the same political entity at the time, that, you know, it's these women who, you know, are kind of dealing with like, okay, so I've decided, you know, I'm, I'm not going to convert and that means I have to leave and my husband has made a different decision. Um, or, you know, I, I have to leave and I don't have a choice about that. But uh, I have this other woman who's uh, getting divorced because she and her husband have decided to go to different places and unfortunately doesn't see which places frustratingly. Um, but that oh, it's fascinating. These, yeah, little glimpses that you can get into ordinary women's lives, even though we we have so little of their actual voices, but it's so, so it's so fascinating to be able to kind of use drama to recreate that. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, the other thing that I wanted to do was to make her having had a relationship with a Christian, because I found lots of stories of um, women, um, Jewish women who um, had, had chosen to marry either a Muslim or a, a, a Christian man. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, she hasn't. She hasn't. It's a secret. No one's found yeah. out. But yeah. uh, and that's why she's kind of still there in the community. Um, yeah. But I just thought that I, I found those stories so fascinating. Yeah. But also the level of violence. So there was a story of a woman who married um, a Jewish woman who married a, a, a Christian man, and the family chased them they had two children together the family chased them down they killed the man and the two children and she was left with nothing i mean yeah. so violent yeah so horrifically violent yeah and, no. you hear, and, and but with real parallel today you know you hear those stories today in in this country i'm sure in america too we certainly hear about them in the, in the uk a lot and that also made it felt, feel very modern yeah yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, we've, we've touched on right, some of these kind of moments of, of violence. And uh, I think I also thought it was really important and I really appreciated that you also included the ways in which uh, women are part of that too. And uh, that you uh, include briefly the voice of Isabella of Castile, who sometimes gets depicted in this very like medieval girl boss kind of way, right? Is this kind of powerful queen and isn't that exciting? But of course, there's also this kind of real way, right? In which she, you know, she's very, she's a very active participant in destroying people's lives. Uh, I'd love to know if there's kind of particular things that you thought about in terms of the the characterization of Isabella, the kind of choice about the uh, the actor who, I don't think we see her, but hear her oh, as the actor, you. right? Who, uh, who portrays her in that, in, um, in her, her, or her voice. Yes, I mean, I, I really, I mean, I really enjoyed writing that part, which really makes me feel very sad and worrying. But um, I, I, I just think it was so interesting. Um, what was a very interesting story about how I portrayed Isabella, because one of the things, this whole sense of um, Blanca being kind of telepathic and being able to, to tune into other women's lives and tell their stories, um, as well as to tell her story. Um, was um, kind of inspired by um, Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children, mm -hmm. which I don't know if you know, but it, it's about the whole idea and the title of Midnight's Children mm -hmm. is that these are the children bought, born at, at the moment of midnight on the date of partition. In, um, the, yeah, so, and they are telepathic and they have this special connection and their special connection is disrupted by, the, by Mrs. Gandhi, um, who is called the widow, and she's a, a very kind of evil character who who causes them great distress and destruction and and violence mm -hmm. in the same kind of way. Um, and so it kind of came from that in a, in a kind of way. But obviously, I've got a historical reality here. Um, of course, we see Isabella through Blanca's eyes. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a moment of real disruption, and it comes out of nowhere. It comes out of sitting listening to the music and the music is swept away and suddenly you hear this voice and it is a bit like a megaphone announcement because it's depersonalized deliberately um, yeah. it's also nice and cheap because you don't have to have two actors <laughs> but, but that's not why i did it it's actually really useful to have this kind of depersonalized mm -hmm. moment 
which is the political statement through a megaphone almost. Yeah. Um, and and scary. Yeah. Deliberately, you know, it's kind of scary. Yeah. It's kind of saying to the other women, it's basically saying to the other women, don't collude. Yeah. Don't collude. Yeah. You know, you cannot trust the Jews. You will must not collude. You must not relate with them. Yeah. Um, and I I just wanted to bring home how this this is this is people's lives yeah. and it was a dangerous place mm -hmm. and I and that's kind of why I wrote it in that way um yeah. you're right I mean Isabella you can you can look at Isabella as a powerhouse amazing that she has this power but you know what she does with that power yeah and what what other people of course not just because she's a woman and the men did it as too um what she does with that power is extraordinarily destructive to that's so many people. Yeah. yeah um and that's really why i portrayed her in that kind of way yeah and also because i'm a dramatist because you yes. so you're yeah. milk for all it's worth um yeah. But I really I'm very much appreciate it. that. Yeah, um, as a, the girl boss Isabella is like a big pet peeve of mine. So I really appreciate it that you really <laughs> kind of emphasize the sort of political violence that she is committing. Uh, so yeah, so I think we only have time uh, given there are these strictures of, uh, of time for the festival. I think we have time for just one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to talk a little bit about this idea of the Sephardi diaspora. So you, of course, already touched on this a little bit, right? In terms of, you know, where, where some of the musical material is coming from. Uh, but I was wondering if you could kind of speak a little bit about uh, your thoughts about the Sephardi diaspora and what role you think that this community's experience within this, you know, multi-religious atmosphere in the Iberian Peninsula had in shaping what is a diaspora community that's also in a lot of ways kind of remains, even though it's very disparate as is the nature of a, of a diaspora community, it's also very united, right? That of course there are differences between the Sephardi communities in Turkey or in Italy or in North Africa, but there's also you know so many ways in which we can really see the survival of a lot of traditions. Gosh, um, well, I, th I mean, obviously it's the starting point. Um, yeah. And I suppose what I wanted to, to reflect in the, the closing, without giving too much away, because I think this has been shown before, um, was I, I kind of wanted to respect that sense of community that is coming, that, that Blanca has shared with people from different faiths, from different backgrounds on the Iberian Peninsula, that she's going to have that sharing with this community, this close-knit community, of her own kind who have been forced out. And yeah. that, there, that there's going to be a kind of creative outpouring, because I think that's what's, there mm -hmm. is something very, very touching and moving about the Sephardic tradition. I mean, I, it, it touches people's hearts. And um, during the lockdown, um, we taught quite a few of the Sephardic songs online at the very you know when, when none of us knew what the hell was going to happen and whether we were ever going to see people again face to face um <laughs> you know those songs really really spoke to people um yeah. in a way that longing that mm -hmm. longing that's just inbuilt in them yeah um, and so i suppose that to me is what is so so important and that that, that all comes back from a longing from for one's homeland yes having been cut out yeah um and i think there's a huge strength in that united experience mm. um in terms of the history i don't that's what i don't know and i have to <laughs> put up my hands and say i don't i know lots of different stories and i know the stories of some of the songs but in terms of how that how to view that i feel i don't feel qualified to entirely answer that question i'd be really interested to know what you think Mm -hmm. Well, I, I will just say very briefly, uh, in the interest of time, that one of the things that I do think is is so striking is the extent to which the Iberian Peninsula really was home, that we're not talking about communities that are kind of loosely connected to a place, right? We're talking about communities that are very, very long standing, And in some places, these are communities that we can trace back to, you know, the Roman period. Yeah. Uh, so these are kind of very ancient communities. These are, these are people with real roots, the people who are leaving Seville, who are leaving Barcelona, who are leaving Valencia, that, you know, they are, they are leaving their homes and places that have been their homes for a very, very long time. 
Uh, and so I think uh, there are such, you know, interesting ways in which we can then see that that homeland is something that that matters for generations upon generations. Absolutely. I mean, I think that that is kind of why I wrote it as a piece that I did, because when I wrote it, it was 2017. It was just after the Brexit vote here. So it felt like a very post-Brexit, relevant post-Brexit uh -huh. piece. But then it's become so much more relevant, I think, um, almost alarmingly so. So here in, in the UK, we had a big um, scandal with the government. It's called the Windrush scandal of the Windrush generation who came over from across the Commonwealth and who often didn't have paperwork. And there's been a big query into the paperwork. And then some people saying, well, no, no, you can't, you don't belong here anymore. And actually those people, the reason they came in the 50s was we all wanted them to come. We asked them to come. We wanted them here and they have lived their lives out here. Yeah. They have, you know, and, and then somebody say, you're not welcome anymore, has a, ha had a real resonance in this piece. And yeah. if you think about the history of the, the Jews and the Muslims too in the Iberian Peninsula, these people didn't even know when they came. They, you know, they, uh, these are people who had been there for hundreds of years yeah. um, and suddenly were told, you don't belong here anymore unless you cross, mm -hmm. you know, it, right. it, it, it's an extraordinary sadness that those stories are still relevant today. Yes. And I think for me, that's kind of why I ended up writing the piece and it's kind of alarming that in so many ways that that resonance keeps come, coming yeah. back again and again and again. Yeah, and on, on the Muslim side, I will say, you know, one of the other things I always tell my students is, so, you know, we have the, the Christian term, right, uh, reconquista, reconquest being used to describe the Christian gradual takeover of lands within the Iberian Peninsula that had been under Muslim rule for a long time. And the, the parallel I always give my students as an American and you know, teaching in the United States is that, well, at this point, these lands have been Muslim for longer than America has been a country. And if the, you know, the British came over right now and said, we're uh, reconquering America, I think we would probably take issue with, uh, with that terminology, uh, right? And so, you know, I think really kind of thinking about that there is this long history of a kind of effort on the part of Christians within the Iberian Peninsula to lay claim and say, we belong here and Jews and Muslims who are here do not belong here. When in reality, of course, it's, you know, it really is, you know, this is home for so many different people. Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, that that home is where people's heart is, as they say, <laughs> that's so true. And that is that is what I think you do get from a sense of the, of the Sephardic mm -hmm. um, diaspora is that yeah. the heart is still there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, Claire, thank you so much for your time today. It was a real pleasure getting a chance to speak with you about your wonderful film, and I hope everybody at the uh, the festival is able to uh, to enjoy it. Thank you so much. Thank you for the brilliant questions, and it's been great to speak to you and to meet you and to learn from you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Bye.